This is a model of a Class 205 produced by Backman, and since their introduction in 2013, you can only buy them as a two-car set. In real life, these were often running as a three-car set, with the two-car set being quite rare and only seen during the early and late part of their history. After quite a bit of thought and research, I decided to take the plunge, get one of these units, and use a model I already had to make a centre car for the Class 205. It's taken me a very long time to reach this stage. Modifying rolling stock is something I've never really done before, and while I'm somewhat confident when it comes to painting, this is certainly a project that uh, I wasn't sure if I was actually going to accomplish. This video is not intended as a how-to, but hopefully you'll get some enjoyment out of it all the same and see uh, my experience of modifying an existing model to create a centre car for this model. I think it's been worth it. The model looks much more impressive as a free car unit than it does as a two car unit. And if you have a model of the Class 205 yourself, perhaps this will help you make a more informed decision as to whether or not this is a project you want to take on. The Class 205, or Thumper, is one of those trains that fades from memory. Not much to look at, nothing particularly remarkable about its design or performance, just one of those forgettable trains that was just in the background. In the late 1950s, British Rail was getting stuck into what became known as the Modernisation Plan, a plan to bring Britain's complex and war-torn railway into something sleek, efficient and modern. While the plan gave birth to many successful ideas and innovations, it was ultimately rushed and short-sighted, and many today would consider the modernisation plan a failure. One of the successful parts of the plan was the electrification of the various routes in the southern region, and born from this was the Thumper, basically a diesel version of the southern region's new electric trains to operate on non-electrified parts of the southern network. Known initially as 2 or 3H units, and later as classes 204 to 207, these machines bared a striking resemblance to the electric units that they ran alongside. If anything, they looked almost exactly the same. The only real difference was at one end you would find a 600 horsepower English electric diesel engine, which sounds a little bit like a class 37. As such, the 205 makes quite a lot of noise when it's running, and these were often called thumpers by enthusiasts due to the amount of noise that they made. Upon entering service, these units were two cars in length and replaced various steam-hauled suburban services on the non-electrified parts of the southern region. Later, many of the sets were strengthened to free cars following a surge in popularity over the new level of service they provided. If you saw a thumper in the 1970s, 80s or 90s, it would most likely be a free car unit. They ran for decades, often going unnoticed in the background before finally being retired from service in 2004. Several units went on to be preserved and still run heritage trains over 65 years after their first introduction with British Railways. A highly successful and reliable train, just not very exciting. So before we get started it's worth saying that this is certainly not the first time anybody has done this to the Backman Class 205. In fact several modelers have done it very successfully over the last few years. I first became aware of the conversion over on RM Web, looking at the excellent exhibition layout Tidworth, built by a chap called Ian, and Ian had taken the trouble to convert his Class 205 to a free car unit, and it certainly looked excellent in the pictures, and he was gracious enough to post a couple of pictures of that conversion uh, in the early days when he actually did it. Along with a few other modelers on the forum as well, I've managed to piece together enough information to help me make an informed decision over how best to go about this project, as there are a couple of different ways to achieve it. So the method I've decided to use is to take uh, an existing Backman model of another train and use that to create the centre car. So I'll be using a Backman Class 416, which is a 2EPB electric unit, which is also two cars in length, and is awfully similar in appearance to the Thumper. I've taken this route because I already have one of these models. I have a British Rail Blue example that I bought in a clearance sale many years ago for about £60. Compared to the pricing today, I really got that for an excellent price. You'll be looking at about £170 now to buy one of these. Indeed, Rails of Sheffield are currently doing the blue and grey one for about £170. So if you haven't got one of these models, I certainly wouldn't recommend just going out and spending £170 quid on a brand new one. Seems a bit of a shame. Um, if you can, try and see if you can find a broken one or a second-hand one that's got some problems or something like that. It's really all you're going to be interested in is the chassis uh, from the trailer car and the two body shells. Uh, the rest of it, you can, you can get by without it, really. So that's the plan. 
this is the wrong colour, it's BR Blue, it needed repainting anyway. I paid next to nothing for it, they are typically quite expensive. I got lucky, it's going to make a really nice centre car for this unit here and it's going to enhance its appearance on the layout considerably and I will get more use out of the thumper unit than I would out of an electric uh, based unit with my layout being situated in the Reading area you were much more likely to see these units and in fact these did work into Reading on many occasions albeit in a free car form hence the reason for this little project okay so as you can see I've taken the model apart we're going to be using pretty much all of it we should be able to get a nice good bit of use out of this donor model and not really put anything to waste the part that's not going to be of much use to us is this section here. This is the die car chassis from the motor end of the car. And as you can see, it's not really going to be needed for the purposes of making that centre coach for what we want. But what it will do is serve as a good source of spares. And I have a spare electric motor, a spare gearbox and spare circuitry for the thumper itself because the models are so similar, Bachmann has basically used the same mechanism underneath. So this is now a very valuable source of spare parts that I will keep for the future, just in case anything is to go wrong with this one. So we won't be needing that. I'll place that into storage. What we will be using is the plastic dummy car chassis with the circuit board, which I hope to be able to use as well so we can keep the interior lighting. This has got the relevant underframe detail, so that'll look really nice underneath the unit. We already have a conductive coupler at one end. We just need to add it at this end, so that will be of good use. We've got two bogies or trucks for the car, so this is going to uh, be really handy. I found these as spares, but you're looking at like £20 each for them, so handy to have that. They've also got the pickups in them as well, so the lighting's going to work. Here's the conductive coupler out of the chassis that we weren't going to use, this one here. So by having that, We'll be able to put that at this end and I should be able to maintain an electrical connection through the entire train so that the lights work at both ends correctly and we only need one decoder to operate the train. Of course we've also got the two body shells. This will be the main body shell that we're going to use. This already has the correct number of doors and windows right up to this point here. It looks just how it's supposed to for the centre car on a class 205. What we will need to do is cut off the driving compartment and the nose of the unit we won't be needing that and what we can then use is we can use this other body shell here and we can use this rear section to graft onto the front of this section and that will then make a complete carriage which looks correct for the centre car on a class 205. If we look at this end of the trailer chassis you can see the hole that's cut into the chassis there for the coupler to fit we want to replicate that at the other end and you can also see the two very small holes drilled in there so that the top plate screws down. We should be able to replicate that at the other end. I should be able to use a drill and a sharp knife to cut that shape out and then we can insert the coupler and fit the plate on top and we should then have a working conductive coupling at both ends. I should then be able to lengthen the wires for that conductive coupling so they connect to the same spot on the circuit board as the coupler at the far end so that we maintain that electrical connection through the whole train and then it should all still work, fingers crossed. Okay, so the first job is underway. We're just cutting that slot for the coupler. As you can see, I'm drilling lots of very small holes in quick succession and then I should be able to cut through that with a sharp knife. I'll then clean that up with various small files afterwards and we should have a very similar shape to the other end and that will allow us to then fit the coupling. Okay, so here you can see the other end. You can see that same top plate that's been salvaged from the other end of the train which is on the uh, the motor car the die cast uh, chassis so I've just used that and you can see it's screwed in in a similar manner to the other end and you can also see two bits of brass rod on those top corners which is just helping locate everything into position and similar to the factory setup at the other end it swings through the V with a spring pulling it back to centre Underneath you can see a similar thing, so I've drilled a series of small holes, then used the scalpel and various small files to cut that sort of wine glass shape out of the chassis of the coach. And you can see how the parts swing through and work. There's a tiny little brass hook that I've drilled a small hole for, 
and then bent a little piece of brass wire glued that with some super glue into position that's just so we can hook that spring uh, back on and you can see the sort of orange colored bit of plastic which is in there as well so it's just a load of plastic pieces to replicate what you find at the other end of the coach when you remove that top plate. With the glazing removed I can now start looking at the scary bit and that is to cut the end off of this unit and replace it with the end of this one so that we create a coach. In terms of distance and spacing and all of that we can use the chassis to help guide us and also British Rail built all these to a relatively standard design so you can see just by looking at the side of it where we need to make the cut you can see we've got window, door, window and then if it was the coach it would just go window, door, window again. If we look at the end of the other unit there is the window, the door and the window that we need to graft on to this section here that's taken up by the driver's door and the driver's window. So we need to make a cut along here and in the same place on the other unit down this pillar here and that will then be two halves that we can join together there will of course be a small amount of filling and sanding that needs doing to make sure that we get a lovely smooth join that's invisible once it's all been painted okay so the project has moved on a fair bit as you can see a little bit nerve-wracking but uh, we've managed to get uh, to the next stage so as you can see I have cut off the cab from one of the ends of the body shells so I just used a junior hacksaw and worked very carefully making sure I did a nice straight cut. Once I'd removed the uh, part of the body shells that I wanted to use I sanded both ends down nice and gently taking care to make sure we had a good fit and uh, just kept sanding them until I got the desired uh, spacing between the windows and I'm now quite pleased with the joint that we've got on the car. So what I did was use the saw and a bit of masking tape to just give me a visual indication of a nice straight line to try and follow and I cut this piece off of this body shell and then filed this piece to suit so what I did was I left a little bit extra material into the coach and I did the same on this one so when I cut the cab off I deliberately cut more sort of this way so that we had an overlap of the two pieces so basically we can keep sanding and sanding and sanding until we get a nice fit which then gives us the coach that we're after and those other pieces of the body shell can be discarded I also found it was quite useful to take a section of the glazing from the model and you can see how the door and the two windows forms half of the glazing and by popping that section of glazing into the end of the model we end up uh, connecting it temporarily using the glazing and that was a real good uh, visual indicator for whether or not uh, we had a good fit for the two parts. So to glue these two parts together I'm just going to use some Rocket Rapid Super Glue from Deluxe Materials and the problem with using some of the sort of plastic glues is I don't really know what this is made from in terms of what type of plastic so I'm not entirely sure what plastic glue is going to work well with it and how well it might actually bond those pieces together so for the sake of just making sure that it goes together and it doesn't come apart I'm just going to use super glue the circuit board that has the uh, the lights to illuminate the inside of the coach uh, just drops straight back in all of the location lugs still line up with the circuit board so I'm really pleased with that that means that uh, I've done a good job of lining up uh, the two parts there is a bit of space underneath that uh, circuit board so what I am going to do just for insurance is put this small square of one millimeter plastic card into position with some super glue and although it probably doesn't need it I'll just feel a little bit more comfortable knowing there's that extra bit of strength inside the model so I'm getting quite close now to uh, applying a small amount of filler to this joint here and just sanding it back and then we'll give it a coat of primer and this whole joint should completely disappear but before I do that you can see down the bottom here I sanded a little bit too much of the body away and we've got a slight gap now I'm concerned that putting the filler in that gap there over time it could crack and fall out so what I'm going to do is take some dust from the plastic just move that out of the way uh, if you look there I've saved all of the plastic dust that I've sanded off of the model whilst uh, getting it to the right shape and I've done that deliberately because we can pour some of that dust 
into this gap here, I can then put a little blob of plastic glue over it and it will create a sort of molten paste of plastic, which will then melt into the surrounding plastic and dry nice and hard. That will get rid of the gap. It won't be a perfect finish, but it'll get rid of the gap. And then we put a small skim of filler over the top of that, sand it down. We should get a really nice joint. Okay, so I've just dusted that over with some Expo Tools grey primer. Nothing special, primer from Halfords or anywhere would do the job as well. This is purely just a guide code to see what's going on, tie the colours together. So you can see we still have evidence of the joint running down the body side. So if I was to just paint that as is, it's going to show up on the finished model. So I need to keep filling and sanding until we get a completely seamless joint between those two windows. During the sanding process, I will probably end up inadvertently removing that small piece of detail just there. That little piece there on the real unit touches the corresponding bit on the door. It's called a door banger and all it serves is when you bang the door open, the door doesn't actually hit the bodywork of the train and scratch the paint. So we can reinstate that with a small piece of plastic, but for the purposes of getting a nice smooth joint, it's going to end up getting sanded completely smooth. I've had a quick rummage around, I could have sworn I had some uh, more suitable filler and I do I've got some milliput here it's very common stuff used a lot in the hobby for all sorts of different things inside the box you basically get two sort of sausages if you like it's quite sort of funny stuff it's got quite a firm texture to it cut two little bits off of each one and then uh, mix them together in your hands for a couple of minutes and you'll end up with a filler that's ready to go so I'll cut a small section of that out and we'll uh, apply it uh, to the model. That will dry rock hard in a couple of hours and be able to be uh, sanded and I think that will get us a bit of a better finish. That's better. So I'll put two large bits of filler on the shut line where the door is, add a little bit left over so I stuck that on the roof and you can see while it's still sort of uh, pliable I've just cut out where the windows are. It would just make the sanding process a bit easier. So I'll leave that for several hours to go rock hard and come back sand it again with the 320 and the 800 grit sanding paper and then we'll uh, try again another little bit of primer from the aerosol can see how the model looks okay so i've been working hard with the filler and making sure it's all sanded nice and smooth you can see how much of a good joint you can get that whole line there is just filled and it's nice and smooth so it should take a coat of paint obviously that bit doesn't matter you're not going to see any of that but it was a good bit to test and practice on and I've just simply been gluing with super glue the 320 grit sandpaper to a lolly stick and then just sanding the model like so you can see all of the excess filler on the sandpaper there so just take your time I'm going to give this a clean and another coat of primer and then we'll see how it looks I might need to do some more filling and sanding we'll see how we go to clean it i'm just going to use a little bit of isopropyl alcohol on a sort of paper towel just wipe it over and then just dust another bit of primer okay so the model is now clean got rid of all of the dust from the sanding and i've made sure any of the solvents have now evaporated just going to use some of the expo gray primer which i usually use for scratch building and any little kits and things on the layout but it'll be perfect for this just put a nice coat of primer on there and see if there's any imperfections left behind. Okay, so I've built up a few light coats of primer and as you can see, it's not bad but we still need to do some more work. You can see there's a little bit of sinkage in the filler just there, and there's a particularly sort of a third of the way 
up the coach there's a bit of a visible line as well as a, a uh, small chunk out of the bottom so I'll apply another very small amount of filler leave that to dry for a couple of hours gently sand it back and keep going so I've just mixed up another small blob of the filler and I've just applied it to the bottom section of the coach to be fair the top section between the two windows is actually pretty good so we'll just do that there just to fill in that last minor imperfection Again, when it's running on the track and it's painted, you probably would never have seen it. But since we're going to all this effort, we might as well get it right. So I've left it overnight and I've sanded that filler down with first the file, then the sanding stick, which is just a stick with a bit of sandpaper glued to it. And then finally the uh, fine sandpaper on the sponge pad. And looking over at the model, you can see where the imperfections were, that little small section at the bottom and that line that we saw earlier further up the panel have now been filled with the filler and sanded smooth. So I'll go ahead, clean this one up again and apply another coat of primer and we'll see how it looks. Okay, so as you can see, we've completed the filling and sanding. I've applied a coat of that aerosol primer to the entire coach, and that's gonna serve as the uh, base for the uh, painting process. Won't be any problems with that. Plenty of people prime rolling stock with ordinary aerosol cans. I just wouldn't recommend it for doing the uh, top coat. You'll get a better finish if you use an airbrush. The airbrush I like to use is this Iwata HPCS. I've had this for over 10 years, and. About 10 years ago, I think I paid about hundred pounds for it. So it was quite expensive, but always try and buy the best airbrush you can afford. All of the ancillary equipment, you can go a bit more budget. So this is just a cheap airbrush stand from eBay. The compressor is a cheap item from eBay and the paint boot itself is a cheap collapsible one that I can just fold away and put somewhere where I'm not using it. And that again was just a cheap no name brand from eBay. So the first colour I'm going to be spraying is the white for the Network Southeast livery as that forms the top and bottom portions of the livery on the side of the train. So I'll be painting that. So I've got a tin of uh, Phoenix Precision Network Southeast white. And as that tin has been sitting around in my collection for a while, it's probably going to have a few little bits of dried pigment in it and some contaminants. So when I'm dealing with a tin such as this one, I like to use one of these AK airbrush uh, sort of straining cups. Uh, similar thing to what you would use in the uh, car body trade when painting cars. You always strain your paint before pouring it into the spray gun. And it's no different in this case, just doing it on a much smaller scale. I've got the compressor set to about 20, 25 PSI. I like to try and spray relatively gently. I don't want a big high pressure jet of paint shooting out all over the model. We want to build up a series of uh, gentle light coats to achieve the, uh, the depth of color and finish that we're looking for. As you can see, after the paint has dried into the cup of the airbrush, there's a few nasties in there. It's always worth using a strainer if you've got an older tin of paint. So as I pre-finned the paint, we're now ready to go. How much thinner to how much paint is entirely your preference. I like to go with somewhere around the 60% paint, 40% thinner, and then I might thin it a little further if it's a bit too thick when I start spraying it. It's all in how it sprays. You'll get a sort of sixth sense uh, for what's right and what's wrong after you get a bit of practice. So I'll turn the extractor on and I'll slowly build up a series of light coats of the Network Southeast White over this coach. We'll then leave that overnight to dry and then we can come back tomorrow and we can mask it up and paint the next colour. Okay, so we're back at the modeling bench. I did four coats in the end, four gentle coats. And as you can see, we've got a nice buildup of color there. And the finish is pretty good. It's nice and smooth. There's no runs in the paint. 
So I'm going to put that in a display cabinet so it's uh, away from any dust and just leave it to dry overnight. It's now the next day. I've left the model for 24 hours to dry and so we can now safely apply masking tape to that white paint without worrying about peeling it away. So as you can see I've masked up a section there ready to receive the dark blue. So we'll get that mixed up in the airbrush, spray it on nice and gently. I like to do a nice gentle application of the paint. You tend to get a bit of a better finish. And also when you've got masking tape here, the first pass that you do with the airbrush, if it's going on nice and gently, you're less likely to get paint bleeding via the door shuts into the areas of white on the model. So it's all little things that you can do to try and help yourself as you go along through the project. And I like to uh, make sure we're spraying somewhere around 20, 25 PSI, nice and gentle and get a good finish. So you can see I've applied a very gentle coat of paint there, what is effectively called a dust coat. And that, as it flashes off now, is gonna help seal those masking tape edges away um, from any uh, further paint uh, bleeding uh, down the door shuts and to anywhere where we don't want it on the model. It's just a little trick you can do to try and improve uh, the uh, success of the masking job. As this model's got an awful lot of doors on it, I guarantee you there's gonna be some paint bleed, so there will be some small touch up with a brush required afterwards, but it's to be expected. I'll leave this for a couple of minutes to flash off and then we'll come back and we'll apply further coats of paint until we get the desired level of finish. I've just finished the last coat of paint. I did about six light coats of paint in the end and I've just removed the masking tape while the model is still uh, relatively wet and I've just popped it in the display cabinet that's got a glass door on it so it keeps the model protected from any dust while it dries over the course of the next 12 hours or so. At first glance it's looking pretty good. Looks like I've managed to avoid any paint bleed at all which is surprising given how many doors there were. So it just shows the effort in putting a furrow masking job onto the model and doing that initial very light coat of paint to help seal that edge really helps. Once you then uh, put the paint on more thickly it's much less likely to bleed onto the adjacent panels. So after a couple of hours I compared the coach uh, to the Backman unit and it was apparent that the two shades of blue were very different. The Phoenix Precision paint um, having a darker uh, overall tone and quite a lot more violet in the paint uh, compared to what Backman have uh, done here to portray the network southeast livery. So I thought well what I'll try and do is I'll try and match the Backman colour. So you can see there's a couple of uh, bits of plastic art there and I've just sprayed those up with different uh, mixes of blue paint to try and get as close as I can to the factory finish from Backman and I ended up uh, respraying the coach in the colour and I've also uh, put that in a pot and placed it for safekeeping if I ever do another project like this in future. So we now have a pretty good match between the uh, two cars. There is still a very slight difference, but uh, hopefully that will mean I don't have to repaint the blue on the two cars, as it would be a bit uh, time consuming to do that. So. so the next thing to do is get the masking tape out again and prepare the model for the red stripe. And then once that's dried, we can do the grey band that runs along the bottom of the model and that will complete the livery elements for the coach. So I've just done four coats of the Network Southeast Red. The model is still drying, I've just peeled off the masking tape, so I'll leave it for several hours before we come back, remask it, and apply that dark grey band of paint that runs along the bottom of the coach, and then we're almost there. Another job that needs doing is the roof. On the donor model for this project, you can see the roof has lots of pipework and electrical sort of detail onto it. And although it's very nice, the centre cart of the Class 205 didn't have any of that. It was just smooth, with the roof ventilators being the only bit of prominent detail. 
So I put a brand new blade in the scalpel, very carefully cut away as much of the detail as I could whilst being careful of those roof ventilators and then sanded that down with various grades of sandpaper. And as you can see there, we've got a nice smooth surface which I'll now prime and then that can be uh, painted the final color at a later date. The roof will also need cutting back slightly at this leading edge here. That's where the cab used to be with its slightly tapered front end appearance. We haven't got any of that anymore, so that will need to be cut back. And there you can see the roof after a quick shot of primer from an aerosol can. There'll be a few imperfections in there, no doubt. So I'll take that back to the bench when it's dried, sand any imperfections out, and if necessary, apply a little bit of filler to anywhere that needs it. just finished painting the grey band so I'm going to leave that for several hours again to dry and then we're going to come back and we're going to do a little bit of corrective work. It's very hard to get all the lines and everything masked absolutely straight and while I am quite pleased uh, with what I've managed to do here there's a couple of bits I'd like to readdress and it will just make the model look a little bit better. So the grey band about here just starts to sag a little bit so that just needs Remasking the colours are going to help me mask a little bit straighter this time round. Can remask that, just blow that grey band back in again. So I'll do that once this is dried and I can safely apply the masking tape. And on the other side of the coach, you can see from about here to about here, the red stripe is a little bit too thin. You see how it thins out. So once again, once it's fully dry, I'll mask that up and just blow that stripe back in again and make sure we get that nice and straight. I've just masked up the model on both sides just to correct those small errors. So this was on the side where the red stripe was a little bit too thin. You can see how it thins out in the middle there. I've just masked up the bit of the stripe that's necessary to be repainted. I need to do the whole thing. On the other side, the grey stripe was lacking a little bit of depth in the middle. It sagged down from the red stripe slightly. And it's just those sort of things that will really annoy you once the model's completed and it's on the layout. So might as well fix it now. It feels like a bit of a backward step, but in reality, it's all good. This type of thing is going to make a massive difference to the overall quality of the job. just peeled off the masking tape and we'll just leave that to dry. I have also uh, in between other little jobs painted the ends of the coach uh, gloss black as per the real thing. In real life as far as I can tell on these centre trailers for class 205s some of this detail that you see on the end isn't needed but as it's going to be always coupled up to an adjacent coach you're never going to notice so I decided not to uh, bother putting a few extra hours into that section as 98% of the time you're going to be looking at it like this. So that pretty much completes the livery for the sides of the coach. I'm really pleased with that little bit of corrective work. It was well worth doing. You can see the red stripe on this side now looks nice and uniform and straight. And on the other side, which was less noticeable in fairness, the grey stripe at the bottom is now also very uniform and straight. And we've got equal distance between that and the red stripe. There is still a tiny chip in the red stripe just there, which I still need to touch up. But that's a very simple little job that I can do later on. I took the model back over to the bench and just touched that little chip on the red stripe in with a small paintbrush and you can barely see uh, where that little bit of damage was so that's all good. That's all the colours finished now for this particular model so the next thing to do is to give it a good coat of gloss varnish. This is going to do two things, it's going to seal the paint, it's going to protect it from any damage that might occur in future and it's also going to serve as an excellent base to apply any transfers. In this case the transfer is literally just one small blue number um, but on a uh, more complicated uh, livery there could be several transfers to apply so it's always good practice to give it a good coat of gloss varnish that might do those transfers nice and easy. 
I'm going to be using Rail Match Gloss Varnish. I always use Rail Match Varnishes. I find they produce a really nice, long-lasting result. I've got models that have been painted for over 10 years, no signs of any yellowing or anything like that. I have found with some of the other manufacturers, uh, especially Phoenix Precision, with their matte varnish, that it can yellow over the years. Rail match, I've not had that problem, so I tend to just stick to rail match whenever I do any varnishing, just because I know it works, and I don't want to have this model being in need of a repaint in about three years' time. The gloss varnish has now dried and I've applied the number to the model. As far as I can tell that's the only transfer that was on the centre car of a class 205. At least the 205 I'm trying to model. There's actually several differences in these when you start looking into it. Uh, so what I'm modelling, because I'm constrained by the original Backman model that this coach is going to be in, I need to make a model of a class 205 from the first batch that were manufactured, so batch one, because that's got all the relevant detail, that's what Backman have chosen uh, to base their model off. So I need to make sure I choose a free car set within that first batch that carried the Network Southeast livery during the time period I model. And as far as I can tell with all the research I've done and poring over photographs, 205009 seems to be a suitable candidate and the centre car in 205009 had the number 6658. So I've cut out some individual coach numbers from a sheet, uh, Fox Transfers Network Southeast sheet, uh, cut those out individually and then placed them on the side of the model very carefully with a cocktail stick and done my absolute best to line them up. But it's a horrible little job you just got to get on and do it. That's as close as I'm going to get it. It's sitting reasonably level and straight. And I've of course done the same thing in the same spot on the other side. I've also applied the silver accent details to the door handles. Hopefully you can see that there. Just another little bit of detail. Make sure that it uh, looks correct and also matches the, the model, the Backman model that's going to go either side of this when it's complete. I'd normally use some silver paint and a very small brush for doing that, but uh, Dave over at Dean Park Station put me onto these paint pens, and my goodness, it doesn't often make the job a lot easier, a lot more precise. So cheers, Dave, for pointing that out. This is the smallest tip uh, that they make for these pens. I just bought these off of eBay. I've got a couple of colours, and they're just really useful for those small, tricky things like door handles. So with the transfers now applied, everything dry, I've just gone over the model and made sure there's no dust or debris on it, Go over it with some rail match satin varnish and that will be the final finish for this model. I'll then finish it up with a very light weathering and tie it in with the other two vehicles as well. We'll give those a very slight weathering too. So that's the final coat of paint so just make sure everything's nice and clean, you've done everything you want to do, all the transfers are on. Once you've done satin or matte varnish, transfers look awful when they've been applied. You must always apply them to a gloss finish. Just putting all of the windows back in. These are the windows from the donor model. They're the same model as this body shell, so they all just pop straight back in. I've got a couple of no smoking transfers to add to them. You can see some of them have got uh, no smoking stickers and some of them haven't, as the donor unit um, was a sort of mid 70s time period where you had a mix of smoking and non smoking. So I've got some transfers to update the windows, that's no problem and I've just glued those windows back into position just very gently along the bottom edge just there with some of the deluxe materials glue and glaze which is a glue specifically for glazing that dries crystal clear so if you do accidentally get any 
on the visual parts of the glazing it won't show up too badly. So that's now dried and the uh, model is pretty much ready to go back together. The chassis itself has had a bit more work. I've used the various elements of interior from the donor model, both cars, and sort of cut and shut and spliced the interior components together uh, to make a interior that's a little bit more correct for the trailer vehicle in a class 205 where you had a uh, 2 plus 3 seating configuration uh, with a walkway running round, sort of down the uh, middle of the coach. You can see I've had to cut a couple of notches on that as well for the clips that uh, allow the body to clip onto the chassis. So I just made sure everything still works as if it was an original uh, Backman model from the shop. I've also taken the time to paint the interior the same colour as the, the Network Southeast 205 model I have here. And the main reason for painting the interior is not so much because you'll see through the windows, um, but because the model has interior lighting the colour of the seats in the interior will affect the colour temperature of the light that you see through the windows and it will look a little bit strange um, with say the outer ends, uh, the outer cars having more of a yellow uh, hue to them and then perhaps this one having a, a white hue just because it's got a different coloured interior. So I repainted that blue just to uh, be doubly sure that everything's going to blend and look like it's all from the same model. And there you can see that LED panel screwed back into its original location. And then we just got the wires just sneaking underneath the interior there, so hopefully that won't be too noticeable through the windows. From the factory there would be some copper contacts coming up somewhere around this location here to tie onto those copper strips in there. Um, but that was all part of the old uh, driver's compartment for this unit now obviously it's been turned into a coach uh, so that bit has uh, been discarded so I've just wired it directly into the circuit board and I've left enough loose wire as you can see so I can remove the body in future for the time where I inevitably add passengers to this train. So there we have the body clipped back onto the chassis and I've just clipped the roof back on as well. I've sprayed the orange uh, cantrail stripes or ready orange colour uh, that you get on Network Southeast livery. Made sure it's the same colour as the two cars that go either side of this particular coach. So that should match up okay. There's a little bit of paint bleed at the ends just there, so I'm going to make sure that I uh, remask that and just touch the roof back in with a little bit of grey just to cover that up. But it's, uh, it's an easy job, it shouldn't take a minute. Uh, there's a little bit of brake uh, detail underneath that just needs uh, sort of a little bit of. A little bit super glue just got a bit damaged from uh, all of the uh, handling on the bench uh, modifying the chassis to fit that coupler so it's inevitable that some of that sort of fine detail get a little bit of damage but other than that it has uh, gone quite successfully uh, everything's clipped back together where it should be and it's uh, gone from a coach with a driving compartment at one end to just a coach so it seems like quite simple when you say it like that but uh, in all reality it's uh, probably getting on for two weeks worth of work uh, to modify it into that state. So after quite a few hours of extra work the model is now finished. I've made a couple of modifications to the ends of the unit just to backdate it a little and make it more appropriate for this layout. So the first thing is I've renumbered both ends to 205009 and then the appropriate car number for each one. You can see the number just above the windscreens there. I've also removed the high intensity headlamp as that was a modification that was fitted during the 1990s. My layout is set from 88 to 90 so that's not really appropriate. So I've deleted that and as a result of that I had to repaint the yellow ends of the unit and do a few other little bits of paintwork here and there. I've also extended the first class uh, compartment uh, by one compartment on the rear car of the train as 205009 and indeed most of the free car units that I could find pictures of have three compartments for the first class accommodation instead of two. I've also added some additional transfers and Network Southeast branding where appropriate and another little thing I did was remove the orange cant rail stripe from the front and rear of the cars at each end of the train. Uh, you might remember previously there was an orange stripe uh, running across the top of the windscreens. Again, that is a bit of paintwork that was done during the 1990s, so I've just backdated the unit to that sort of 1980s condition. 
given the amount of work and hours that I've put into the model, I thought we'd do a little final flourish at the end. So I've treated myself uh, to a sound decoder and it really sets the unit off and gives it that real characterful noise that these units were known for. So the main reason for getting this unit was obviously to run it on the branch line. The ESU sound decoder that's in this unit supports the lens ABC braking that I use on the layout. So I'm not even holding the controller and as you can see the unit is uh, stopping to a precision point that I've set up previously and it will coast very gently before coming to a complete stop. And then it will wait, change direction and trundle up and down the branch line. I was a little bit concerned as to whether or not my homemade coupling would do the job, but so far it seems to be working well, right down to second radius curves.
So that's the model basically complete. I'm really pleased with how it's come out, particularly the colour match. I spent quite a lot of time trying to make sure that that blue matched the shade that Backman had used as close as possible. And while it's not exactly 100%, it's certainly close enough for running on the layout up here. So learned a few things, had a really good time putting it all together. It took a lot longer than I expected, but certainly worthwhile. I'll be back as soon as I can with the next project, which will be back working on the layout itself. Sometimes it's nice to take a break from the layout and do something with the rolling stock, and I've now done that. So I'll come back, focus on the layout again, and do some more scenery in future.